that everybody was my current favorite absolute favorite song um it's by dean lewis called be all right and i've actually been running on the song uh this morning and yesterday morning um and it's actually a great song for running you wouldn't think so because it's not like fast but when you're doing endurance running and you just want to jog consistently at a steady rate perfect song so by the way hello um if this is your first live stream with myself which is quite possible please let me know if it's your first time catching me live my name of course is gerda muller i'm a clinical psychologist in private practice um, founder of the psych professionals yourpsychonline.com and of course private practice success australia and that is what i'm here to talk to you about today a very very interesting topic as i come to you from my home office which is here in brisbane so if you hear dogs barking and all of that type of stuff it is because i am home at the moment sitting here with my lovely sidekick abby right over there making sure everything runs smoothly because we've been having some uh, internet and electricity issues earlier today but i said it will not stop me from going live because i've been wanting to talk about this topic for the last couple of days so you would have seen how about i actually check out my own live stream on here make sure i'm live <laughs> that would be helpful um, because it also helps me to see comments more easier than what i can see it on here hey jessica how are you going so abby is this live stream is on my page right mm -hmm. okay so let's go to the page itself so where am i there we go hey jess how's melbourne today and who else is on here please say hi say hello because um facebook doesn't always tell me who is here um just so that i know so i want to speak about a really topical topic topical meaning that it's been an issue of discussion in my various facebook groups there i am i am live so i will check out the comments in there as well so i want to talk about hey allison welcome welcome so glad to have you here so i want to share with you today my top strategy for when you can't find clinical teams so if you are in my private practice success um, uh, um, for allied health professionals general facebook group you will know that this question has actually come up over the weekend and not only over the weekend actually at various times it comes up at in all my facebook groups around people just going oh my goodness am i the only one struggling to find uh, clinical team and it's not just that people can't find people that's the right fit it is really getting people to apply in the first instance getting more applicants so that you actually have a pool and you have more choice to choose from versus then also finding somebody that's the right fit for your practice based on values and based on the model that you run at your practice jessica says nice and sunny here today fabulous hey grace how are you going welcome to the world of private practice success hope you're doing well so i thought you know if this is a topic that's constantly coming up in our private practice success community then i must definitely need to address it because obviously you guys would know by now uh, having been in private practice for 10 years myself working now with private practice owners from around australia including the lovely sheree that has just joined us and she's from western australia of course and and that's the thing i work with practice owners from western australia tassie up north townsville mackay darwin all the places adelaide it uh, doesn't matter where you are people are telling me that they're really having these difficulties in finding good quality team all right and i'll just say now that obviously i generally tend to offend people with what i say because i have no filter but that's because i really want to give you the the what i regard as the best possible advice me having learned through trial and error multiple times sometimes i've had to learn the same lesson multiple times because i'm very headstrong and you know i want to share it with you you might go gerda you're talking bulldust um you know that's okay but for me to sleep at night i need to tell you how it is all right so if i'm going to offend anybody 
I apologize in advance. No, actually, don't apologize. No, you need to hear the stuff. I will not apologize for you needing to, to hear what you need to hear. And if you don't like it, it probably tells you that it's something that you need to look at, right? Hey, Melanie, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. So let's get stuck into it because I only have 30 minutes until I'm doing a, a consult with one of my Inner Circle members. Hey, Tess from Tessmania. Um, that, of course, is the new name for Tasmania, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> hey, Tess, I'm talking about all things finding team. And I have actually been working since last month because I'm just like working on it little by little on a handout like a, a, a mini ebook as part of my um, book funnel after I attended a book funnel retreat on uh, my top five ways of finding clinical team but this is um, that book is all about Cherie says I don't have to apologize thank you Cherie I'm all good then uh, Tess is spooky I just finished talking about the same thing where where why how did I miss it I was probably on my run or in the shower afterwards um anyhow so i'm actually working on uh this little handout as part of my book funnel um funnel that i that i'm still putting together after i attended a book funnel retreat in adelaide you guys might be aware of that because i share my whole life as you know uh with all of you and it's basically my top five strategies for finding team and it really goes in deep into the um know how the actual do this do that take this step take that step both looking at paid as well as unpaid options but you know what that handout will be no use for you whatsoever if you don't get this current strategy right the one that i want to share with you right now and that is the most important st uh, um, strategy and that is the right mindset when you go into this process okay it's so important to have the right mindset asking people where to advertise how to advertise where to find people is not going to help you at all if you don't enter this this process with the right mindset because mindset is the most important strategy now a lot of times when people ask this question in the facebook groups the first thing that they do and you know bless their souls is they go you know oh maybe i need to change my model maybe people don't want to be uh, employees or maybe they don't want to be subcontractors and uh, i find a lot of practice owners are going maybe i need to change my model maybe people don't want to work for me um, because of the model and they don't like it or how i pay or how much i pay and that type of thing and i'm not saying that is wrong i think it's really great to be reflective to be introspective, to say, what am I doing uh, and what could I be doing better? Okay, um, most certainly. However, to just making a decision to willy-nilly change your model that you use in your practice because you've had six months, 12 months, 18 months even of really struggling to find team is not a good enough reason to change your model okay hey Carla how are you going glad you could join us that is not a reason to change your model because do you know that changing your um, business model ie how you employ your talent your clinical team has got such huge repercussions for you as a business because that's what you are guys you are a business for you as a practice owner for you as the person that carries 100% of the risk in your private practice um, and and then you want to just change it because you can't find team that's not the right reason to change it you need to ask yourself and this is the reason to change your model because I'm not against changing your model okay I have worked with practice owners that has changed their model whilst working with me both ways I've had people have a complete team of employees and change them to subcontractors I've had people have a complete team of subcontractors and change them to employees and I've had people that does a mixed model you know it's okay but it's it, but you don't take that business decision based on uh, what you suspect the reason is uh, why people don't want to come or you want to entice people in you need to always come back to what is aligned for you 
okay? Come back to inside you, coming back to your vision for your practice. It's why a business has a vision, right? Um, in terms of going, why am I doing this thing? Did I just fall into private practice? A lot of people say that and it probably happens, but you know, I didn't just fall into pra private practice. I made a conscious decision that this is what I'm gonna be doing with my life. If I wanna make a difference, I wanna become a psychologist first and foremost. And every time I expanded my practice, it was with that vision of making a difference and helping more people in more effective ways. Um, whether that was at that point where I went from a solo practitioner to taking on my first people, to move from a one-room practice to a three-room practice into a four-room practice then adding a second practice completely another second practice to starting your psychonline.com to starting private practice success right it's all in line with that um, desire with that vision of making a difference because I ah, that's my swimming pool cleaning itself making a difference because you've got only one life to live and doing it in a way that allows you to help more people in more effective ways. Not just because I'm desperate to get somebody in, it needs to align with my vision, right? Uh, Sheree says, boy, I've been asking that big time this past few weeks, why am I doing this thing? Yep, yep, uh, I know. And it's a really important question to ask. And if changing your model Either way, even if you want to change to room rental model, okay, make sure that it's aligned because you need to live with this decision, okay? You need to live with it for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, and people want to change their model because they want to get peep clinicians in and they want them to stay at their practice for like forever or for many, many years. It's like, you know, let go of that, that want because how fair is that to that clinician? You know, what if, what if they want to start their own private practice? What if they decide they want a career change? What if they decide that they want more or that they've got a vision that they want to pursue? You know, um, pursuing your vision and your passion shouldn't only be, you know, available to me and you as practice owners. And I think it's really unfair expecting clinicians to just stay with your practice forever. Um, and I think most business owners can tell you that, right? That people come and people go. Uh, yes, you want people to stay as long as possible, you know, and there's nothing that annoys me more when a clinician goes, yes, I'm committing to two years or three years or four years with your practice. And then six months in, they go, oh, no, now I'm going to go do something else. That's just like, <sighs> here's one of those things I'm going to say, Abby, that's going to offend people. You don't deserve to be a psychologist if you do that, because it tells me that you've got no no duty of care towards those clients to go into their life for six months and then go, I'm out of here. I'm going to go do something else, something more exciting. Um, no, that's not a true psychologist. That's not somebody that's truly aligned to making a difference because you are making a bloody dis difference. You know what you're doing? You're adding to the stigma of mental health by going, you know what, just in and out, there's no consistency, I'm abandoning you, I'm rejecting you, and um, you rationalize in your mind why that's okay. So that just annoys the crap out of me because it's not right towards the client, first and foremost, most importantly, and secondly, if you've made a commitment, maybe I'm a bit too old school here, if I tell someone I'm gonna be doing this for two years, I will do that. That's just how it is. If you've missed my blog that I wrote a couple of days ago on my Facebook page um, of how I doubled my business turnover, you will um, hear me talk about a significant financial commitment that I made for 12 months. Um, you know, and at any time and at various times, I had the thought of, you know, do I really need it? Um, you know, what else can I do with that money? And I go, no, I've made a commitment and I'm going to stick with it. And if I'm investing that money, it just means that I need to make three, four, five, ten times that amount of money right now. That's what I need to do because being true to your word is so, so important for me as a person. And when I have team members that can give me a commitment and they stick to it and they end up um, leaving to, you know, go work somewhere else, start their own business, start their own practice for whatever reason, I will support them 100%. 
I will help them. I've actually mentored current clinicians into starting their own private practice and they're very successful with that today. Why? Because they did the right thing. They told me this is my commitment to the practice. I went, I'm very happy with that. They stuck to it. But if you're just gonna uh, you know, go back on your word, I've got zero, like zero respect for that. And that's just how I am. Okay, Cherie says, love old school. Can I employ you, Geta? <laughs> hmm, I'll think about that, Cherie. Uh, the biggest issue is that I'll need to move to Western Australia and I don't think that's going to happen. Not that I've got anything against Western Australia. I just love Brisbane. All right. So the bottom line here is come back, come back to your vision. Why are you in this? Come back to alignment. What model aligns for you? Now, there's a couple of things that you might want to consider. Okay, because a lot of people find it really hard to tune into that internal stuff and that's okay. You may be just a bit more logical person, which is perfectly fine. So for those logical ones amongst us, I want you to consider a couple of pointers because again, this comes back to mindset. So when you're making this decision around your model, you really want to think, you know, what type of person am I? Am I a person that loves control, to have my little fingers in all the pies, to know exactly what my team is doing, to check all their reports and all their letters and, you know, to tell them exactly this is how you do it in the step, in that order, blah, blah, blah. You know, if, if you want a lot of control, hey, Joanne, thanks for joining, of your team, then an employee model is probably the way to go. If you want less control, then a subcontractor model is the way to go. Let me just preface this, however. Having a subcontractor model doesn't mean that you are completely hands off, okay? Because they still drop the ball. You still need to have checks and balances in place, okay? So for example, um, we at my practice, we are subcontractors for um, our local ATAPs. And I'll use the word ATAPs because everybody knows what I talk about when I say that word. Of course, every darn PHN now calls it a different name. Um, our PHN calls it psychological therapies, but it's the old ATAPs work. And we as subcontractors just don't get paid unless we've done all the notes in their system. Okay, so somebody checks that. So you also as a practice owner with subcontractors still need to check, are they adhering to all the Medicare requirements, all the requirements of the different types of referrals because they're just human. They drop the bloody ball, all right? Um, but there is more control for them in various aspects of their life. But at the same time, if you are a control person with employees, what if those employees don't like to be micromanaged, you know? So it's again, finding that person that's the right fit for you. And, and you know, a lot of people like the employee model because they think they can control employees, but you know what? It's really hard to control a lot of them. Why? Because it comes back to you. And that's my second point. So the first thing is, do I like a lot of control? Yes or no. And knowing where that, that boundary is with both employees and subcontractors. And of course, room rental is a completely different story. Um, but then it comes back to you as a person that is leading a team of clinicians. What type of leader are you? What type of manager are you? What type of supervisor are you? What type of entrepreneur are you? Uh, you know, whatever word you want to use because you are the leader at your practice. Okay, so if you're going to have employees, you're going to have to have the strong management component to what you do in terms of doing performance management, not three months after it was needed, right then and there. Okay, being okay with conflict, um, being okay with, you know, having those really difficult decisions with employees, being okay with employees arcing up, reporting you to fair work and that type of stuff. You need to be willing to be that manager that's going to be okay with all the emotions, stress, anxiety and stuff that goes with that right? Doesn't mean that subcontractors can't be trouble. They can be a handful as well. All right. So it comes back to, do you know how to lead the steam that you want to lead? 
Okay, are you a person that uh, when you have employees, you know, are okay with knowing you're paying them irrespective of whether they've got clients or not? And for me, that was a big deal of why I um, don't have employees, all right? Because I felt that all the responsibility was on me to ensure that they um, have enough billable hours in the day for me to pay them and pay all the bills. Okay, whereas when it's a subcontractor arrangement, it's like a shared responsibility. Um, and I can't tell you the weight it took off me when I moved to a subcontractor model. It just takes so much weight off. Yes, I'm still solely and 100% responsible for the rent, for the admin team, for the bills, all that type of stuff. I know that, okay? But it just makes it so much easier because the fact of the matter is sometimes you get really crappy employees whose client don't come uh, attend and you know psychologists sometimes don't like uh, engaging in reflective practice they will tell you they do but when you do they 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 make allegations like and and this is not for me because i don't have employees but i speak to practice owners every darn day around oh just because a practice owner is talking to an employee telling them to pull up their socks telling them to work on on engaging clients is like oh you're bullying me oh you know are you putting all this pressure on me oh what you're doing is unethical it's like oh my goodness you know and you need to be so careful time time check okay yes so what you are really saying, Abby, is good to stop going off on tangents and sharing all these stories and get to the point. Okay, but that's how I share my points. Um, so it's about knowing what is going to be required of you as a person because you know you the best when you want to lead a team of employees, lead a team of um, subcontractors or have room rental. So any questions so far, please feel free to comment to ask questions. Another question that came up um, as we wait for people to comment in the group was, um, and it may, may have been some other groups as well, yes, now that I think of it, uh, that I won't mention the names because it's not my group, but around, you know, how much is the right award rate to pay, for example, and, and how much is um, our health professionals and support services award, which is our private practice award, compared, let's say, if you have employees, of course, we're talking now, to the public mental health. And I read that stuff and I just go, you know, it's like, it's so unrealistic to try and compete with public mental health. It's like crazy. It's why there's a separate award for private practice. Okay, because even the powers that be, even the government recognizes, okay, that we as small business cannot compare with public health. And if you're gonna try and do that, be my guest, okay? However, it's very risky. And you might think maybe this is gonna be my competitive advantage because I'm gonna pay uh, public health rates to my team. You're gonna to have to manage that team as a flipping, I'll use the flipping rather than the other one, profit center. You're gonna to have to be on it every day, checking how many billable hours are we, you know, um, covering all expenses. Am I covering 17.5% leave loading, all the other perks that comes with all of that stuff and all the money that I need to pay, the, the, the super, the tax, all of those commitments, you're gonna have to be on it on a daily basis. If you are not that type of person, if you're not a details person, if you don't like being on that type of stuff, you're going to have to go and employ an operations manager or a practice manager that you're going to have to pay good money, uh, which is an additional expense to stay on top of it. Because I can tell you, you're going to find it really hard in the long term. Uh, and you probably are going to have to still be working five days a week seeing clients in order to still pay yourself a decent wage and even make up for those days and weeks. Uh, that you can't pay your team because it's going to happen, okay? Because it's completely unrealistic to try and compete with public mental health. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. And then what makes me really passionately object is when you have clinicians come into a practice. Um, and again, you know, um, this is not my clinicians. I'm not saying my clinicians are perfect. They're pretty close to perfect. But I speak to practice owners around Australia and they tell me these things are happening to them where they will have clinicians 
in their practice that um, don't even want to take in payment because they're uncomfortable taking in payment from a client after a session. They find it extremely hard to talk to the client about this is what we charge and there's cancellation fees and they really want to waive fees and they want to really bulk bull all the clients. So the clinicians on the one hand really struggle with, with charging the money from clients but then they expect the poor practice owner to be paying them Queensland health rates or wherever you are in the world. Obviously, I'm in Queensland. Public mental health rates, it's like, hmm, one plus one should be two. One plus one is not minus 100. And that's where your poor practice owner is going to be. You know, you can't speak out of two mouths when it comes about two money. Um, if you um, don't want to charge for your service, you can't expect to be paid a great rate. I mean, where's the money supposed to come from? We don't get funding. Okay, um, is, should the poor practice owner be paying you out of their back pocket, taking out a second mortgage, which has happened? Thank goodness, I've never had to do that, but I know of practice owners that have had to take out a second mortgage on their house to salvage their business because of these type of things. And you might not believe me, but you need to remember when private practices close down, and they do, I know of multiple ones that close down, both um, in various at least three or four, um, uh, um, like uh, where's where's Adelaide? What's what state is Adelaide? I don't know, but with Adelaide South region, Australia. New South Wales, Gold Coast, those are just the recent ones that I know of, um, where people, you know, it comes out to me, where I find this out when I talk to people, uh, where private practices have closed down. You need to remember if a private practice closes down, they're not going to go onto social media and proclaim it to the world. The poor person just failed, okay? Um, you know, there's a, your ego gets hurt when that happens. So you just don't know that it's happening, but it does, but it does. And I get so passionate because I don't want that to happen because if you close your doors, you can't help people. And isn't that why you are a helping professional to help helping? You can't do that if you can't keep your doors open. So, um, you know, it's like, you need to be realistic here. The money has to come from somewhere. And if even the government acknowledges that we've got a different award, again, be my guest. Try and compete with them. You're probably going to be talking to me in two or three years and go, it's the biggest mistake I've made. And again, it comes back to also that vision and alignment. And, you know, if you are happy to continue working five days a week, seeing clinical clients to pay other people's wages, if that's going to work for you, awesome. But I would rather have me pay me an awesome wage for being the one that takes all the risk if I'm doing clinical work. And I've always wanted the freedom to be able to decide how much clinical work do I do? Do I do one day a week? Do I do five days a, a week? Because I do it out of that love, right? So, yeah. What else? I've got like little notes that I made after I made my run. This is like the notes for my little talk to you this morning. Because I always go, I forget stuff afterwards and I go, oh, I should have said that as well. So I thought today I'm going to write them down. The other thing that I want to say, because I literally have eight minutes before I'm speaking to one of my inner circle members is you need to be patient. Okay. Uh, I find practice owners can be extremely impatient. Um, you also need to remember always come back to the fact that I am a business. As a practice, I'm a business. I'm not a charity. I'm not an NGO. I'm not a government department. I'm a private business. And any private business are going to have awesome years of growth and expansion. And then they're going to have a year followed by um, a lean year. Is that the word? A lean year. Where there's little growth and expansion. And I sometimes find that our our practice owners have such, they're such achievers and it's like they're always changing the goalposts. And I really want you to remember that you need to be realistic here. You can't expect every year to be a year of massive growth and expansion. It's actually not good for business. Every now and then you're going to need to have a year where you're just sustaining things, which just, yeah, we've made this growth. We've had this leap. We've had this improvement. And now the success is being able to sustain it because anybody can be a flash in the pan. Anybody can have a flash in the pan here, okay? And you feel so awesome about it, 
but uh, you know, when you're realistic about it, the next goal then is to sustain that. It's like when you have clinical clients and you want to decrease their dust results in the dust 42, and then you want them to sustain it, right? You don't want to want them to get better and it just be a flash in the pan. That's no fun. So again, guys, please be realistic. Don't have such unrealistic expectations. Don't put that on yourself. It's hard enough doing this thing that we do in terms of trying to run a business. Now, um, there's much more that I could have, that I can say, but I, I think I've made a lot of points, um, a lot of great ones, um, a lot that's going to be challenged by people. And, and that's my goal is to challenge your thinking. You know, um, if I am able to challenge your thinking, I've done my job. You do not have to do what I say, but I want you to just sit back and just think and just reflect and going, what is right for me? And that's what you do. Okay, you don't have to do it my way. You need to do it your way. You need to make that conscious choice. And whatever happens, whatever the consequence will, will be the natural consequence, but it will be the perfect consequence for you. And it will be part of your process and, and, and your journey, right? So what I also thought I might do um, is because in, when was it, February this year, I actually did a talk um, at a conference, private practice conference on the pros and cons of the different uh, business models in private practice. I spoke about just being a solo practitioner, having employees, having subcontractors and room rental. So there's four main um, uh, models of business in private practice. So what I'm going to do is I am going to do a training on that and I'm going to expand on it. I'm going to add stuff because that was February and, you know, I, I learn new things every, every day. Every day is all I learn new stuff. I'm going to expand on it. So for anybody that's interested in getting a copy of that training, um, Abby, I had sent you a PayPal link. So it's, it's not going to be a fancy webinar or anything like that. I'm going to actually record it. Um, I'm going to ask people that um, register or that sign up for it to send me all their questions around this so that I can collate it beforehand. Abby, maybe put in there... Um, the PayPal link as well as your email address so people can send their questions to you and Abby can collate all of it. But remember the topic is the pros and cons of the business models. All right. Because again, I want this to be there to help you make an informed decision for what is right for you. Um, because obviously you guys would know I love subcontracting. That's what works for me. But I want to share with you all the pros and cons of all the others as well. So... Um, how we will run it, I don't know when I'm going to record it, <laughs> I haven't decided yet, but I'm going to record it at home um, on a PowerPoint presentation, talking to you, that type of thing. But I first want to make sure I've got quite a number of questions, so send it to me. I'm going to charge $47 for you to get access to this recording. You will have lifetime access to it. We will send you the link to the video. You can watch it over and over at your practice to really help you embed this knowledge and make an informed decision for what is right for you now also please note if you are in my inner circle 12 month inner circle or six month inner circle or whether you are in um if you are registered for master class and if you are in my next level mastermind do not pay for it you guys get it for free as part of your membership to um, those um, groups all right everybody else it's $47 now it, for some of you this might be just the incentive you need to join the next level mastermind group maybe just put the link to that in a separate comment uh, because you get your first month for a dollar I think and then it's an ongoing monthly membership fee so you can read about what's included there but this is just part of the perks that you get as part of being in that group so free to next level mastermind masterclass graduates as well as masterclass people that's coming in October and the two inner circles those are the guys that get it for free and for the others is $47 which is a no-brainer for the information that you're gonna get all right I need to run I hope this was helpful everybody um, I look forward to coming back here and checking out any comments um, for those of you that couldn't be here live that's watching the recording so it's bye from me for now and remember as always all you need to do is say yes to your very own ultimate level five
private practice and I will speak to you again very soon. Bye for now.